Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you all for coming. My name is Kani Mutupalas, and I'm uh, president for Cultural uh, Affairs here at the National Hellenic Museum. Um, we uh, strive to have interesting programs, and um, uh, we hope to see you in our next ones. Today, we're particularly privileged to have with us Dr. Panos Veramis, who is Veramis, who is not only uh, very knowledgeable, but a very charming speaker and. Um, very engage, very engages the, the, the public. So um, I will not go into presenting him. I will leave uh, this job to someone who is more knowledgeable. So I will introduce you now to Faris Pabamikos, uh, uh, newly arrived at the University of Ch uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, and lecturer in modern Greek studies, who is also very well versed in. Um, uh, more contemporary issues in Greece. And of course, um, all of this would not have been possible if it weren't for a good <coughs> friend of the museum, Dr. Nano Marinatos, who's a uh, 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 great scholar in the wrong right. So, Dr. Bocomigos. Thank you, Tony. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here, welcoming all of you, as well as Professor Veremis. Uh, I'm really looking forward to more opportunities like this in the future. Uh, collaborations between the Hellenic, uh, the Museum of Hellenic uh, Cultural Civilization, as well as the Modern Greek Studies Program at UNC. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, and to be introducing Professor Thanos Veremis, uh, currently Professor Emeritus at the University of Athens. Professor Veremis has held in the past decades important posts in uh, uh, not only uh, as a professor of political history at the University of Athens but in other equally prestigious institutions abroad at Tufts, in Boston, Harvard, uh, Oxford, LSC, among others. He is a prolific writer and a very approachable one as well which is always um, uh, very a nice thing uh, when it comes to um, distributing material of his to, to my students. He has uh, written extensively on the role of the Greek military in, the, in Greek politics throughout the 20th, 19th and 20th century. And he has also produced some uh, wide-ranging uh, um, general histories of modern Greece that uh, touch upon quite a few of the issues, I think, about which he is going to talk uh, about to us today. Um, questions like uh, the, the structure of economy, uh, the, the political system, clientelism, and, and so on. Uh, he is a man of many hats. He has been uh, instrumental as a historical advisor in a path-breaking documentary that was aired by Sky TV a few years ago on the Greek War of uh, Independence, the Greek Revolution of 1821, which uh, caused quite a stir among the Greek public. And he's also currently um, a, a councillor, uh, a member of the Council of the Municipality of Athens, uh, some years ago, he also headed uh, the Greek uh, uh, National Council for Education. He was therefore equally involved in, in shaping or attempting to shape educational policy in Greece. It is therefore uh, both a great pleasure and an honor to have once more the opportunity to, to hear Professor Veremis. And uh, I'm really looking forward to an engaging uh, uh, lecture as well as a lively discussion. Professor Vermis, thank you for being with us. I, I wish I was up to this height. <laughs> as the new generation has the advantage of several feet over the old generation. So there you are. But I think the new generation, by the way, has made much more progress than just getting taller. And that among what I'd like to say from the very, from the outset of this discussion is that there is hope in Greece, mainly because there is a generation of young people that are now appearing, coming up, uh, who are very, very, they 
hopeful. We are hopeful, rather, uh, because they are doing a good job in many different fields. Now, first of all, I'd like to thank Koni, Mutupala, and Dimitra uh, for organizing this event, and uh, the Onash Foundation for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, they paid my way, in other words, and my upkeep. So there you are. Now, the subject of today is uh, the subject of today is the current crisis in Greece. It appears to be a fiscal crisis, but it's not just a fiscal crisis. It's a multifaceted kind of crisis. It uh, contains many different things. It's also a crisis of a way of life that we have to give up. Sooner the better, the sooner the better. And uh, before going into the particulars of the present crisis, I would like to say a few things about the Greek economy in general and how it was always has been. The Greek economy was never a strong economy in terms of uh, producing goods and exporting goods. Well, Greece was never an industrial country. It was became much more industrialized after the uh, cheap labor, if you like, from Asia Minor descended upon Greece when the Asia Minor uh, refugees came to Greece and worked for a pittance. That helped industry begin in Greece practically. So it's a very young prospect, the, the industry of Greece. It never really excelled uh, heavy industry especially for a variety of reasons which probably are too, too many to go into now. But um, Greece had other sources of income. The major source of income was, was uh, agricultural production. Nothing to write home about, but nevertheless, that was the basis of the economy as long as Greece has been a, an independent state. Uh, as of the 20th century, or end of the 19th century, early 20th century, other sources of income appeared. Uh, the seafaring Greeks, for instance, became a source of income for Greece, uh, more so than they are today, in fact, because uh, in the beginning of, of, uh, Greek, uh, of the Greek merchant marine, uh, most many Greeks worked on ships. They don't anymore because it's a hard kind of existence. So it's others that do the job, uh, but certainly uh, Merchant Marine was always a source of income, a very strong source of income. During World War II, most, much of it was destroyed because it took an active part in the war. It fought on the side of the English. In fact, the English had leased most of the Greek ships. And at the end of the war, Greek Merchant Marine practically didn't exist anymore. But the owners did, and they found their way through the liberties, you may have heard, buying uh, very cheap uh, ships or being granted cheap ships, cheap ships from the United States. Um, and that was the beginning of a new era of Greek uh, ship owning. Uh, we must say today that uh, Greece is number one in tonnage in the world, still number one. It has been number one for years, but it's still number one, and it's doing very well, apparently, still. Um, the other source of income was tourism after World War II, and it still is today. In fact, it's one of the greatest sources of income uh, for the Greek uh, economy. Uh, last summer was a bonanza, practically, for Greece, it was without precedent in terms of numbers of people and, and of, of income that they generated for Greece. So, and of course, if we go back in time, another source of income was remittances by the Greeks in the United States and Canada and later in Australia and so forth and so on. Now, remittances are not a source of income anymore, obviously but uh, it used to be. The problem with Greece is that it's not a kind of solid economy that you can depend on. 
It is very much prone to changes of international politics, weather, you name it. Any, anything that varies affects Greek, uh, the Greek economy. And as of uh, the post-dictatorship years, in other words, after 1974, uh, the Greeks started off well uh, with very high rates of uh, growth, uh, but after a while, um, there were elections in 1981, um, Paso comes to power, Andreas Papandreou has his own agenda, and unfortunately, Andreas Papandreou's agenda was really redistributing income, but not income generated by by um, uh, by pro production or by taxes. Uh, in fact, he didn't tax the Greeks that much, and therefore kept them happy, and they kept voting for him. Where did he get his money for redistribution of income? Loans international loans. So he was in fact redistributing loans and by doing so he undermined the future of this country, of that country. And the other bad thing Andreas did was uh, to increase uh, the minimum wages, to increase wages in general, especially wages in the uh, public sector and Greece has a huge, always had a huge public sector, very more than it, it, it needed, in fact, and this is another big problem. And uh, to give you an idea of um, uh, how much the public debt uh, exploded because of such methods, was that in 19, the beginning of the 1980s, the Greek uh, uh, public debt was 23% of GDP, of gross uh, domestic product, GDP. By the end of the decade of the 80s, it had reached 60%, and a few years later, 100%. So we start off with 100% uh, public debt, uh, percent of GDP, which is a big problem. When anyone goes above 100%, things are looking are not looking very nice. So, Pasok was very popular, obviously, by distributing distributing funds. But in spite of some of Papadreou's financial advisors and some ministers, in fact. He always agreed, he said, yes, yes, you're right, we must stabilize the economy, we shouldn't, you're very right, we shouldn't do this. And he went on doing what he thought was more advantageous for his vote getting. I must admit that the man was a genius of sorts, but not the kind of genius that helps an economy such as the Greek economy flourish. He was a genius in many other things. He made his public love him. He was an affable kind of politician. He always fought against a, uh, an invisible enemy who no one identifies with the enemy, the enemy is somewhere else. And he said, you those people who do this, that, and the other. And people said, right, he's so right. It's not us, it's the other, the other somewhere. Including the United States of America, including whoever, whoever was not uh, part of, 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 of his uh, uh, immediate environment. In fact, his immediate environment was almost handpicked for its lack of ability and talent. <laughs> Why did he do such a thing? Why did he do such a thing? Because it made him feel secure. He could manipulate people with, uh, without much to, 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 to present by picking the yes people. In fact, they used to say about Aikis uh, Tsokhatsopoulos, um, who is now in prison, is now in prison, one of the few, of the few, of the few who went to prison, uh, they used to say about him that when Papadreou asked him, Aikis, what time is it? He'd say, whatever time you say, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So that gives you an idea of his environment. His foreign policy was, was absurd. <laughs> absurd in the sense that he believed that Greece's future was with the third world, with Mr. Gaddafi, with Arafat, with uh, all the strange people in the group. I mean, really strange in every sense. Now, how on earth did the Greeks buy that? I will never know. I will never know. I keep saying, even to Papadreou people, if I saw adherents, I'd say, what does being part of the Middle East mean for the Greeks? They're not Muslim, they're not third world, they're not uh, a series of things that you have to be in order to, 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 to attempt to enter the, third, the, the, the Middle East. And they said, well, he said, we all knew that he didn't mean that. It's the first time in history where people vote for a politician because they know he will not do what he professes to do. <laughs> That's another first in, in international politics. You vote for somebody because you, you're, you're convinced he will not do what he promised. <laughs> Greece is a strange place. <laughs> but it's a first. It's a, it's, it's, it's a first in Greek history. Let me tell you this. A person like Andreas never appeared before. There have been bad politicians, there have been very good politicians, there have been mediocre politicians, but no Andres. That's an entirely new phenomenon. Why do I say this? Is because he is a person who came forth from the United States with excellent qualifications, with his mind was top notch in every sense. A man who uh, went to Harvard, uh, very well, got his PhD, taught at Northwestern University in Minnesota, and finally Berkeley, California, and did very well, apparently, from what they say, is not an ordinary kind of mind that you meet every day. However, his populism, in other words, his um, conviction that the little man, the average person, the uh, median, let's say, in statistical terms, is the pillar of society we ought to look for uh, for, for, for a, a symbol of our, of our future and our present. And uh, this is where things become very strange because Greece had never had this kind of populism in its history. Why? Because Greece was too poor to afford this kind of populism. No peasant in Greece wanted his son to become the average Greek peasant. I mean, no peasant. In fact, he said, my son would be better than I am. He'll be uh, an engineer or a, or, a, or a doctor or a lawyer or an officer in the Greek army, anything except what the parent was. And so the parent would put money on the side to have his son study and excel Hence, Greece has probably, the, not probably, for sure, the highest percentage of university graduates in the entirety of Europe, which is true. So Andreas comes forth and says, ah, forget all this. Ah, you're wonderful the way you are. Don't change a thing. <laughs> if you have a big pot belly, it's wonderful. It's, it's not like the Greek statues, but it's a sign of prosperity. It's very nice. And he went on and on and on. And people loved him for that. Because he took people who felt sidelined by society, not very successful, uh, who were told by their father that, you know, you the Instagramata and all that. And suddenly this man comes forward and says, You're great the way you are, don't change a damn thing. Hence he was loved by his public. Now I made a rather large uh, introduction to the subject, which is the crisis of today. But much of it, I must admit, is, goes back to this era of deficits and, and public debts and so forth. Now, it's fair to say that Andreas's electoral success made new democracy follow his footsteps as better as it could. So by the end of his career, he had managed to transform the entire um, 
picture of Greek politics, not just his own party, but new democracy as well. And without a center party anymore that disappeared early on, there was a conservative uh, right and a, and a conservative left in Greece. And there is Mavreou as the conservative left, as, and the Karabalis Jr., finally, Jr., as the conservative right, imitating one another. So uh, there is much that um, new democracy leaves uh, to be considered as a success. There is nothing, in fact. Um, and the two parties finally merged into this coalition of today, which was natural, because there is very little difference between the two, in fact, nowadays. Uh, on the other hand, the left, the new left, uh, is entirely different. Uh, Mr. Tsipras's party is a populist, populist left party, as opposed to a populist conservative party. But in his own way, he's conservative as well. He conserves values of, 19, of 1917, let's say. He still believes that there will be a grab for power and that uh, there will be a communist paradise some, sometime in the future, or thought. Not anymore, as he approaches power, so he tends to throw in the throw out the ballast of, of, of this of this parlance of the parlance of revolutionary activities. Now, 2010, with George the Second Papandreou, little George as they call him, your guys, <laughs> little George, little George, um, after promising that there's money, after all, there is money, after all, in the, in the coffers of the Greek state, he realized that there wasn't much, there wasn't anything. And he started to, he launched austerity initially, and then he went to Europe to ask for help. And the help came in the form of a troika of three, um, two from Europe, one from the International Monetary Fund, International Monetary Fund, the Central Bank of Europe, and the European Union. Uh, Greece was already a member of the EMU, of the Economic and Monetary Union, which made it even more problematic for Greece to remain in that position. But I should say that why in the EMU, which is Simitis's job, work in getting Greece into the EMU, it sounded wonderful initially, and it may prove in the long run, run a good decision, but it's too early to tell. Right now we're undergoing this crisis, and if we manage to remain in the EMU, we will be uh, happier than not. What, Greeks, what Greece did after entering the EMU, it was a great opportunity to, to borrow money with very uh, low interest rates. Initially, it was 0.5% uh, interest rate. The spreads were very low, very low. Greece could have borrowed uh, and, and used the money to, to make works of infrastructure, to put it in good use in other terms. What did the Greek governments do? They hired more people for the central, for the for the civil service, for the social, for the public sector, and the public sector kept uh, growing and growing and growing to no avail. And had they chosen the people in the public sector through competitive exams, at least we would have had an enormous public sector of qualified people. God knows what for, but still qualified. Here we have a huge public sector with unqualified people, because most of the, most, not all, of the uh, uh, hiring that was done under Andreas, under, sorry, under the, the last uh, 20 years, uh, was um, on clientelistic and party politic criteria. Therefore, all this money that Greece borrowed went to increasing the public sector and therefore its deficit. 
This is the black hole, let's say, of, Greek, uh, of the Greek economy. And in fact, when Greece went out to borrow money again, uh, even with the help of these uh, three paragons of stability, let's say, the Troika, uh, Greece also signed a memorandum George Papandreou did with the Troika, where he agreed to fall in line with the prerequisites of the Troika. Obviously, beggars can't be choosers. If you are a beggar, you have to submit, unfortunately, you submit to your, uh, uh, those who help you or lend you anyway. And this is where the Greeks started to complain, because the policy of the Troika, rightly so, was austerity. You have to cut on everything, and indeed, much of the public spending was cut, except for people who were, it took, uh, it took the Greek uh, government a long time to, um, to, to, to agree to lay off people in the public sector. Because as we all know, people in the public sector are there forever. That's the idea. You cannot, you cannot uh, uh, make them leave. There are ways, of course, which are not unconstitutional, and that is to consider their positions redundant. If you consider positions redundant, you can lay off people in the public sector. And this is what the government did, but too late and too little. And of course, a huge number of reforms that the Troika suggested that the Greek state didn't want to, 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 to put uh, to practice. Why? Because anyone who did it would lose his uh, uh, voters. Uh, most Greek voters in the past especially hoped that they would get their children into government and therefore they would be secure for life. Not well paid, but secure nevertheless. So these things began to change uh, radically. All this made the Greek public very unhappy. And laying off people meant of uh, bloating unemployment. Greek unemployment today is 27, maybe more, 27 percent. And in in the sec in the youth sector, young people, uh, it's even more than that. It's 55 percent. So if you're a young person in Greece, you really you look at the future with dark glasses, and rightly so. And we have a big brain drain people who are good usually leave the country and seek opportunities elsewhere. This is probably the worst thing of all, because whereas in the late 19th century and early 20th century, people who came to the United States came from all sectors of life, mainly from the agricultural sector. They came to the United States, they did very well, and their children even better because of these values, family values that want the children to excel and not populism there, no populism there. Um, and they improve their livelihood. Uh, now it's people who have, could make their mark in Greece if there was an opportunity, who have to leave. And this is a true problem nowadays. The other issue of the crisis is that Politics have gone down the drain, practically. That's probably the least promising aspect of, of the crisis, is the situation with Greek politics. Uh, I might have mentioned last time when some of you were here uh, that one of Greece's saving graces was its political elites and its, its leaders in the past. People like um, Ioannis Kapodistrias, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, um, Alexandros Kumunduros, Harila um, Ostrikoupis, uh, Elefsevios Venizelos, Constantine Karamanlis, Konstantinos Karamanlis, were really top, top uh, leaders uh, and statesmen, some of them, true statesmen who saved the day when Greece was in, imperiled by a variety of reasons, either economic problems or uh, foreign policy problems or wars or whatever. They made the right decisions, saved the day, 
that Greece uh, has much to remember from these people. Alas, we have come at the probably pit of the barrel when it comes to our present politicians. And I say it with grief because everyone is looking for the next uh, Eleutherios Venizelos, or at least of the next Alexandros Kumunduros, or at least of the next uh, Panagis Tardaris, for heaven's sake. I mean, anybody will do that. Nowadays, what we have to show is, is really second rate, if not third rate, in all parties. Uh, the Communist Party is, is, is a, it's like the, what's the name of the science museum with those dinosaurs, you know? The Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum. It's consistent, I must say. That is a party of consistency. It's all dinosaurs. Which is fine, I mean, uh, okay. But, but Syriza, the incoming party, is worse than that because they are a mirror image of Andreas from Andreas' populism, a left-wing language which makes no sense whatsoever in the modern world. It's not a social democratic party which would say, yes, the government sector should be larger, as the liberals say in this country, and the uh, republicans say, no, it should be small or the smallest possible and so forth. Uh, in Greece, by the way, there's consensus that the public sector should be large. Why? Because it's a source of patronage. If you don't have a large public sector, how can you hope to, 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 to employ your friends and clients and what have you? So that is where the problem lies. Everybody loves the public sector, with few exceptions. Stefan Manos was one and his diminutive Drassi party, which I joined. <laughs> and I enjoyed being there because it's a very high level people in terms of education, but it didn't even get into parliament, you see. That's how little it is, how little appeal this kind of ideology has in Greece. It's nothing to do with the United States, where the Republicans are in for the very same reason Manus is out. I'm not saying that Manus is a Republican, by the way, I'm a Democrat uh, because my father was a Democrat and we go on and on in, in the Democratic Party, I should tell you that. But it's very strange that whereas the Americans believe in uh, private, uh, private, the private sector and private initiative, the Greeks hate the private sector and private initiative. They love the large, the large uh, public sector. If you reverse the American picture, you'll have Greece. <laughs> and this is strange, because the Greeks are known for their inventiveness, for, their, for the hardships that they undergo in order to improve their livelihood. As soon as they get out of the madhouse, they, they, they improve. They do very well. They do very well in every sector, practically. And this country is a good example. I mean, why do they do it here and they don't do it in Greece? There is an answer to that, but it's a very long answer. If you insist, I can explain. Okay. The structure of society is very different. For one thing, there is no civil society in Greece at all. Civil society doesn't exist. The Greeks are not used to working together as a group anywhere. They are small cells or family cells which increase their, their influence by bringing in friends and clients and kubarus uh, and you name it. And the, the, the circle increases. Hence, Greece is like a baklava. <laughs> it's all, there are of course all the strata of the baklava there. But it's cut in small pieces, you see. In fact, if we could make the baklava into small uh, pyramids, it would be even better, because each piece is a pyramid, really. The high point, the smaller, the larger, larger as it goes on the bottom. So imagine a society of small pyramids. Uh, Ernest Gellner 
called it, it's not my own idea, unfortunately, um, called it the segmented society or the segmentary society, a society which is cut in pieces and can never work in unison except for special circumstances when somebody is at the gates and wants to enter the country and take it over. Then the Greeks become one. But that lasts as long as the danger lasts. And when it's over, we're back to, to our segments. That, I think, is one of the reasons why Greece cannot succeed, the Greeks cannot succeed within Greece. They all belong to a little something, but that cut society up in smaller pieces can never accept. And politicians are made of that stuff, at least those that are not statesmen, as the ones I mentioned before. And mind you, all the Greek politicians that excelled in Greek politics came from abroad somehow. Kapodistrias, had never, I mean, had lived in Corfu when he was young. He went to, to Russia, uh, he became the foreign minister of Russia, and he also became the, uh, the man who drafted the constitution of the Swiss. The Swiss still remember Kapodistia, mind you. Switzerland, a country of great success. Excellent case of many different peoples, Germans, French, Italians, Romans, whatever they, they are, they all managed to, to, to live together in this very unique constitution, the confederation, the confederacy of Switzerland. And that's Kapodistrius is doing, by the way. So Kapodistrius was an enlightened individual, had never lived in Greece. He came, he did the utmost in three and a half years, or three and something. He was assassinated, obviously, obviously. And um, that's, that was the end of it. Then, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, he lived most of his life in Constantinople. He was a fanario. He knew the outside world. He was an excellent and very democratic politician. The same is more or less true for Harilos Trikoupis, who grew up in England, because his father was the, Ameri the, the Greek uh, 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 ambassador to London, minister, as they called him in those days, the Greek minister to London. Therefore, he studied in England. He loved the English system. He came back to Greece with his, his, uh, his uh, love for parliamentary democracy. And Eleutherius Venizelos, in a sense, came from abroad, because Crete, in the early 20th century, was a country which was closer to European and international politics than Greece itself. So when Venizelos came to Greece, he knew much more. He was better versed in international affairs than any parochial Greek politician from the Peloponnese or whatever, or Atiki. So these people did a wonderful job. After the war, it's parochialism, with the exception of the one and only that I mentioned before, who normally should have brought probably the greatest uh, uh, success story in Greek politics, but he did the opposite. He brought Greece back to the, back to the future. <laughs> he, he, he practiced all the, the problems of traditional Greek politics to an excess, to, to an excess, Andreas. That's our problem. Now, back to, 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 to the present situation. And I should stop here because I'd like to have a discussion with you. I think this would be more interesting for me. And uh, I should say that in spite of the appearances, there is hope in this crisis. The appearances, of course, is that people are taxed out of their wits. I forgot to tell you about the taxation uh, issue. You know, the Greeks, it's a, it's a has always has been a national sport to fool the state and tax evade. This is a national sport in Greece. But now we can't afford to practice this sport. It's a thing of the past. We ought to give it up. And uh, unfortunately, those who are captive of the tax man are people who live on wages, be they public or private uh, employees, as universities also tend to be. Now, these are the first pay more than they can afford, 
in, this, in this, these circumstances, under these circumstances. And uh, in the case of Greece uh, today, people like myself, I mean, if I tell you what I make, you won't believe it. My, 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 uh, fortunately, my father, who came from the United States, had put a few dollars on the side, hence I survived. <laughs> Yet, still, at least I have a roof over my head, which is mine. It's a nice roof, I can't complain. But uh, my pension has been cut by half, practically, by half. And uh, normally, if I were a not an endowed individual, uh, I would have a, I would have trouble uh, uh, living with half of my pension and support my good wife. Uh, my children, fortunately, are old, uh, older. They don't need my help anymore. But I can imagine how many people are undergoing hell because of these cuts. Of course, there is that other half of Greek population that tax base. And who are these people? The professionals who don't necessarily have to, to give uh, receipts for their services. So half of Greeks of Greece lives at the expense of the other half, if not more. And this is how things are. I am hopeful, however, that in spite of all this, the Greeks are beginning to show signs of, of, of uh, coming of age. And some of the things that are happening while all, this, all these problems appear, uh, for instance, solidarity, social solidarity, there's much more of that now. People will help those who can much more now than ever before. The municipality of Athens has, I don't remember how many soup kitchens who feed a good part of, this, of the population, the churches doing a good job in setting up soup kitchens and, uh, and shelters for people who are without uh, uh, a home. But let's also give credit to that indomitable uh, a, a, a Greek family. The Greek family has made a great difference in these difficult times because no one remains without, I mean, with a family will not remain without uh, a plate on the table and without uh, a roof over his head. I imagine how things would have been in places, let's say, like England, where the family institution is not very strong. Um, when parents tell their children, OK, now, son or, or my daughter, you're of age, as they say. <laughs> you know, come in every Christmas, maybe. <laughs> so there you are. If that happened in England, we would have a veritable revolution today. If there was a 50% and 55% unemployment, God help that country. It does not happen in Greece because of the family institution, I think. That's partly the case. But there are many new ways of facing the economy. Startup companies. There are many startup companies in Greece some very good ones, in fact. Um, new agricultural upmarket products, a new thing. What the Cretans are doing in our filthy rich, uh, Yorgo, right, is they produce early uh, vegetables. So in other words, they go into the European market before every, anybody else is awake. So they get their share of the market. Now, these are smart things. These are smart and, uh, ways of going about the problem. Uh, it will take time, though. And frankly, the only real danger right now is early elections for the reasons I mentioned before. Should we have early elections in that? And that is highly probable. All this may go down the drain, all these efforts at austerity, at collecting money, because this last year was the first year that Greek managed to produce a primary surplus. To produce a primary surplus in your budget means that you can begin paying off the principal of your debt. The principal, not just the, the, the interest rates, the interest. And that would be
be wonderful if we could keep it up. Should we go into elections? God save us. I mean, that there will be, in fact, not one election, but a series, because I doubt that even Caesar can get in unless there's a landslide at the last minute. In fact, I'd rather Caesar got in uh, than have a series of elections. That would cost much more. Caesar would probably get in. It would do very poorly. That's my prediction. And may change its ways, or we may, the entire scene, the political scene, may in fact change for the better. There are some signs. I, I mm, personally prefer, that's my preference, the river, the Potani. Why? Not because Stavros Todoraki, uh, a journalist, is God's gift to, to people, but because some of the people that have gone into that party have nothing to do with traditional politics. They're good professionals, interesting people, good company, and so forth. So I have a hope that this may develop into a new liberal center, liberal party. With that, I would like to stop here and open the discussion with you. Uh, 
and the only wine there was in Greece practically was the Mesca. The Mesca, you can't drink the Mesca at all. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the owner doesn't hear this. But it was awful, and that was the only wine there was. Nowadays, there are scores of good wines, and that's a good beginning because Greece can produce many good products if people put their minds to it. As, it, as it does oil. Olive oil is becoming a boutique uh, uh, thing in, in, in airports and other, and other products. It just takes love, uh, imagination, and perseverance to produce things that can be. And look at, at Switzerland. So, okay, you'll tell me Switzerland is a, is a kind of oddity of history, but still. Switzerland in the 17th and 18th century was a very poor state. It was dirty poor. There was really very little there, except mountains and, and grass. And they managed to take advantage and started a dairy industry, which has surpassed all others for years in Europe. And then they started working with, with clocks, because they had these winters where they didn't know what to do, and they started tinkering, <laughs> making watches. So they went on and on and on, and they produced something which is important. Fine. The fact that they had their banks and took advantage of all the warring Europeans is another thing. That's another thing. Okay. But Greece could do well also. I mean, for heaven's sake, what is it in the Swiss that makes them smart? I've never seen a... Is there a Swiss in the Swiss? <laughs> I'll forgo that statement. <laughs> anyway, so there you are. I mean, I think there is a chance. Not in science. In science, there's something good in Switzerland. Huh. You don't have to. You don't have to write grant proposals to run your laboratory. <laughs> in the end, they give you the money. So you just want a laser, and you call the department, and they order the laser. So we have a few colleagues from the chemistry department now. There. So, Professor Yanaki. Yeah, thank you. Just building on this, I think the question that you were asking was also, are there, do you see any change, any structural changes in the way, yes, uh, changes what the European uh, or the Troika go often reforms, like reforms. Do we see any reforms happening in Greece right now, such that they will change the climate so that there will be, you know, more room for entrepreneurship, or you know, more room for the development of the of the private sector as yeah. opposed to public sector. Because, as you also said, the public sector was basically not touched. Okay, fine. I haven't seen, to the extent that I can follow the Greek news, I have not seen any structural changes that necessitate, you know, cutting portions of the uh, public uh, sector or rearranging stuff in ways that, you know, we're going to have fewer uh, positions. Even the reforms that were attempted at the universities, at the university level with the program, with the Athena, the Athena program, a lot of the changes that were, you know, meant to happen in the end with collapsing departments, for example, to save uh, positions, I mean, to, to save money by creating fewer positions many of them were not implemented, or the changes were actually not put forth. Well, first question, um, there, has, there have been some structural changes. They have opened up certain professions, not all, but certain, which is something, not everything, but something. Um, and they have managed to get rid, finally, of civil servants, public servants that have been in purity, whatever the term is, that have, have right, been... but that is a very small number. It's a small number. And it is not really a structural yeah, change. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just it's a small number. And the, some public uh, uh, corporations have been sold. I mean, it's not the entire corporations, but sectors or parts of public uh, corporations have been sold to... Uh, to the private uh, sector, and um, the university, I am, will be happy to tell you that at last, at last, with three years delay, 
has begun or began or begun began begun whatever to work to work uh, according to the Anna uh, Diamandopoulou uh, law. This new uh, prefect of the University of Athens, Fortsakis, is a blessing. Uh, he's, he persists in his ways, and I think. Syriza has realized that they can't create a conundrum among other universities because initially they said, ah, now we're going to get them, we're going to have people in the streets. Nobody, Nobody. came. Nobody reacted to the insistence of Fortaikis to use, uh, to use uh, private police in the university and check who gets in and out. That was a subject of great commotion. Yeah, yeah. It did not succeed, and Syriza now, and this is really bad news, is working with secondary education. The They've country. taken over many schools in, in Greece. I have no idea what they're after. I mean, the things they say are, are absolute nonsense. Nonsense, equal opportunity, more jobs, I mean, snow in the summer. <laughs> Amazing thing. I mean, they make no sense whatsoever. Nevertheless, they've taken over and now they're trying their hand with secondary education. And this shows the tigatania, as they say, tigatania to system. So uh, my hope is that they will not succeed there. They're losing the fight. They have been losing it slowly, but now I think I, I'm happy to see that the new law is, in fact, working. Yeah. Professor Veremis uh, spoke about startups, and I'm wondering uh, uh, what's the prospect of uh, medium and high technology startups or enterprises that uh, have a, uh, the possibility of uh, providing uh, the basis for a new economy as it has happened in other countries? Well, consider Israel as an example initially. Israel was endowed with high educational human factor, let's say, and put it in good use and made all kinds of companies that don't need heavy industry or, or mechanical uh, 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 superstructure, infrastructure, but the human mind. When the Greeks went into that, then they're doing a good job now, especially with software for cellular phones, this is what my son does, that's why I know it better. But there are many others who do this kind of thing. They're doing well. I'm not saying that they will save the economy because it's still a small uh, sector of the economy, but who knows, it may come to something much more important. The truth of the matter, as my son tells me, is that the Greek market is full, full of young people who are qualified, who have PhDs, from MIT, from Princeton, from Harvard, from Uni University of Chicago, from Northwestern, from the University, of Calif uh, the University of Illinois, and so forth. And they're looking for a job. So it's a buyer's market right now. In fact, my son at some point said, oh, no, I want to leave Greece. I can't stand the, 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 the uh, paperwork and the public sector that makes your life miserable for any small enterprise you want to put on, to put up, you have to face this maze, this labyrinth of uh, the public sector. And then, of course, all the, the corruption, people who want uh, uh, kickback, uh, and so forth. And he said, ah, I'm going to leave. And since we have, with my wife, we have two grandchildren, we freaked out. We said, my God, we're going to lose our grandchildren. <laughs> And fortunately, he changed his mind. After a while, he came back and said, no, I'm not leaving after all. Because where will I find such a market of good people who are looking for a job? Whenever he publishes, comes up with a position, he says, we need a position of, with prodiagrafes, you know, whatever. Hundreds who turn up, hundreds of qualified people. And he told me, this is amazing. I mean, you can't choose one is better than the other. So there you are. I mean, that is a point where Greece can do very well if we get our act together. I think we would. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Yes, you. Professor, you made an excellent point about the beggars cannot pick the terms, right? Beggars can be choosers. However, however, the fact is that there's a qualitative difference between uh, countries and individuals when it's about beggars. And certainly, the punishment has to fall a specific scale as well. So you may uh, be able, you may have to bring an individual to his knees, but you cannot bring a people to their knees. Oh, okay. I think. You just I think, leave them at their feet, you know? Can, can I have? Sure. Where do I have a second? The thing is, if you do that, it's not practical. You can do it, but if you do that, the social unrest and its consequences are going to be huge. So what happens is, you kind of lose the source, and eventually source that would give you back the money that you lent them. I'm saying this because there's a huge uncertainty, as far as I'm able to, to know in Greece, about if all this, all this makes sense. Uh, and I, frankly, personally, I don't understand why our creditors are not helping this government or just any government in this matter to take some more reasonable and, uh, I would say, friendly measures by 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 lowering by lowering the gain so that there's no social unrest increase and people are more willing to work with any government that's up there. Because you see, yes, they did well to um, make the public sector smaller. However, they had not prepared an alternative source of financial injections to the market. So the thing is, they were correcting one thing by making mistakes in another. So, that, that, that's the, so what is your take about that? What makes sense? Well, I'll play the devil's advocate. I too believe that they should have been, if, if I speak to, to an audience of our creditors, I would tell them exactly that, what you say. That it's not ultimately to your, to your advantage to, to be very harsh on the Greeks. But let's not forget that there was a haircut, a, a substantial haircut in our debt. I mean, it was what, 100 something billion. It was no small amount. So one third, I think, of our debt was put on the side, was, was granted to us. That wasn't a small favor. I mean, I, I resent some of the tough tactics, but I also resent the Greeks who say, OK, that's fine, that's, we had it coming. Now let's go for the next take. And frankly, I think Pagarus was right when he said, you know, we had it together. In what sense? Of course, we didn't all conspire as much as, let's say, Akis Zuchadzoglus may have. If he proves to be, and I think he will, a culpable, obviously not. But we all did our little something in the traditional sense of undermining the common good. I mean, by parking the car, let's say, on the sidewalk, you make children and old people and in people who have infirmities impossible to go out in central Athens except for one street which is Panipsimim. All those small by streets you have to go like a, you know, car by car. And that's small stuff, obviously. But then tax evasion. Tax evasion, the Greeks are champions in tax evasion. Now, we did it in a way, if you add all these things up, or the the, the ticket that the Trochea gave you, and you have a friend and say, eh, hey, come on, okay, okay, don't worry, crap, 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 and it's finished. This happens in a wide scale, you see. If so many people do this, there's a difference. It's not as though as if one or two people do it. Everybody knows someone, more or less, almost it. So there is widespread Petty corruption. Petty corruption makes for problems for a state. <coughs> that's my that's my problem with with Anis. Yeah. I wanted to say I had a privilege of uh, 
Redundancies. Redundancies, but it's still a secure job. I mean, if we <laughs> compare what happened to the private sector and the public sector, okay, it's still yeah, a privilege. Yeah, you yeah. have a totally more impoverished society within which the public sector still remains the secure sector. Can you imagine what would happen in any society? I happen to work for the Embassy of Greece in Washington, and I remember our ambassador had uh, met with the members of Congress said that they, had they tried to implement one tenth, one hundred of the kinds of reforms that they did in Greece, there would have been a revolution in the United States. Yeah. So it is not easy to take a society that has been living one way and overnight changing to something different. But I think the question is something more fundamental. We know that the Greeks uh, uh, are champions and tax evasion and all these things. Why? This is my question, why? And I feel that it has to do simply with consequences and incentives. When you live in a society where there are no consequences for what you do, the most safety person is going to not pay the IRS. Do you think I would pay the IRS <laughs> if I had a choice? Or any of us? I think, but do we dare? Because we know that if they find out there's hell to pay, and I'm sure that the same things would happen in the US if the consequences were as lacking as they are in Greece. That's one thing. The other thing is lack of incentive. You're, you work in the public sector, and by the way, it was Karamayish who even enlarged the public sector by purchasing all these companies. And you work in the public sector and you work hard and the person next to you doesn't work at all. They get the same raise, they get the same incentives, there's right. no difference. Right. Right. So there's nothing that kills uh, drive as much as that. But I think overall, um, the way I would describe the, the, the way we live in Greece now, people live in Greece, kind of dictatorship, not a political dictatorship, but at some point, as an individual who tries to achieve something, you just give up because you become exhausted. You cannot fight the bureaucracy and you say, you know, I can't do this anymore. You know, I can't be waiting in line for all this. So in essence, I think what has happened is that the Greek people gave up, gave up their individual power as individuals. If it's not the state that will tell them, sort of limit your the chances, it's the political party. You never see great people fighting for their own good. They used to fight for, they used to march down the street for, you know, um, mm. the fate of Afghanistan or the, whatever. So, Greeks do not, I used to work with the Ministry of Education and uh, mothers would call me up and they would say, the minister has to call the teacher because she took my child to a field trip without checking it would blow my mind and I would say, you're the mother, you're supposed to call. But the Greek citizen does not feel that they have any power. So even if you take some of the court, it takes 15 years to get a case or anything. So people have just given up, they, they drive. Well, that's partly true, but not entirely. Uh, there is a very, by the way, just for the fun, there is a very funny cartoon where this man walks into his bedroom and finds his wife with his best man or whatever. And he says, Who is the Kratos? 
that where is the state? What is the state doing? On the other hand, on the other hand, there is this fragmented or or segmentary society that works instead of the civil society mentality that we lack. Why? Because we're all, or were, not more, but we're happy in our little circle of friends and, and connections, and we say, what the hell, we're doing fine. That was the incentive for, for, for working for our public good or the good of our, let's say, even our corporate good. Everybody said, to heck with the corporate good or the common good, even why, less. Why? Because we were smug in our little circle of friends and connections. That was a disincentive. Also, maniki autocratoria, in a sense. Okay. Don't forget the amatoria, the procrity, everybody happy in his own little whatever. And many unhappy people, no doubt, who didn't have these connections, but uh, still. So that's one reason, I think, probably. No, no. Okay, so I want to say some uh, positive things about my experience in the last few years. Uh, like most of us here, I have been living abroad since 2000. I think I came to go see around 2000. Could you take the mic? Yeah, I have a voice on my mouth, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I apologize for my voice, I can't make it stronger. So I have been here at UIC since 2000, and I have witnessed a great deterioration of my country during the fat years, the, the post pop Andrea. And the deterioration was not economic, but it was aesthetic. I've never seen so many ugly houses being built uh, with so much, with so little regulation. A huge polykatikia, cement houses everywhere. Nature was destroyed. I mean, an absolute pollution of the environment. Number two, I witnessed a lot of lawlessness during the fat years. Cleftes, pandu, bandits breaking into the houses. Where was the police? There was no police. Um, and um, frantic driving uh, all over the place. Uh, cars, innumerable cars. So I was actually uh, very very unhappy. I saw a kind of deterioration of quality of life. Conversely, the crisis, I think, has brought many good things that we should remember. We shouldn't constantly keep thinking about the economy, but the byproducts. I have seen much more police now. Vias, do you know about Vias? This is this patrol, uh, which they patrol the countryside. They are uh, usually two pairs of uh, young men on motorbikes and they go everywhere dressed in black <laughs> and symbols of order for a change. Number two, I have seen uh, an improvement in the quality. Spectacular museums, the Heraklion Museum is a miracle. Has anybody been to the Heraklion Museum? If you, it's a, isn't it beautiful? But that's an old, that's an old miracle. No, it's, they just finished it. Well, just finished it. Yes, a new exhibition, it's absolutely spectacular, first rate, and many other museums. So, the appropriate the yeah, appropriate oh. is spectacular, but I'm saying as a byproduct of the crisis, there has been more structure, and something good has come out of it, and common sense. I think people didn't turn violent as we were afraid of. Um, so let's be optimistic and work hard. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, buddy. Uh, I think. But, uh, you are first. So I would like to hear your comment on the Troika. We talked a little bit about that, but. Uh, we talked about reforms, talked about bad things that they've made us do. So, do you think that Greeks are a nation that needs someone like Troika to make the necessary reforms? And if yes, have they done that? Are, are we ready to get rid of them and go back to where we were? I would be happier if the job of the Troika was the job of a Greek uh, Troika. As all of us, that would be the idea, because let's face it, as Connie said before, if there's no traffic uh, 
management, I mean the Greeks who are left to their own devices, as any people are. I mean any people with North European exceptions like Denmark, where a Dane told me once, I can't understand your tax evasion at all. He says, it's like stealing money from one pocket and putting it in the other. I said, brilliant. He says, he's right. He's right, but it doesn't occur to the average person to say, when I'm taking money from the state, I'm taking money from things, benefits that will come to me. It's only the Danes that can come to that conclusion. But practically any other country, ah, you know, people will say, what the hell, you know, I'm not going to pay my taxes if I won't suffer the consequences. So a, the, 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 the force of law, unfortunately, and this is human nature, uh, works better when the law is implemented. And there are sanctions for that. In Greece, Cohen is right. There are no sanctions, really. I mean, you can get away with all kinds of shenanigans. You can get away with all kinds of shenanigans. I would like the Troika into the Greek state. Uh, a Troika of Greeks. Because let's face it, these foreigners don't know Greece at all. And sometimes they go into well, they present their own interest. They present their own interest, obviously. They want to, to, to sort of really make the toothpaste to produce whatever it doesn't have anymore. And it it's makes people unhappy with no reason at all. So yes, I agree with you. I would rather there was another Troika. But I, we, we certainly need some regulating factor. If we are left to our own devices, we will revert to Hiliotakosa Ecosiella, you know will become armatoli. Everybody will come out and say, hands up, give me your whatever. I mean, this is it. This is the kind of society. Uh, just, just a comment, a follow-up to what uh, Connie uh, said, and then a question to you, Professor. Uh, that, that's an excellent point, I think. Uh, partly the answer has to do with a culture of legalism in Greece. Uh, Greece has traditionally been, the political system has traditionally been manned by lawyers. And lawyers tend to think of laws. And uh, there is therefore a kind of a fetishization of the law in Greece. As if the passing of a law would instantly provide a solution to the problem. And we see that over and over again. We have one of the most bloated, detailed constitutions in Europe, actually. Yeah which is essentially unenforceable. It's, it doesn't work, it's inoperative. We've seen it with the anti-racist law that was about to pass, did pass, at the end is most probably not going to be implemented. As if that is every solution to a social problem is or should be through legislation. And this is a historical characteristic of the evolution of the Greek state and of the evolution of the Greek society and eventually of how a Greek elite has developed. It's an elite of lawyers, it's an elite attached to the state rather than an elite of entrepreneurs, businessmen, uh, people that is that work with a different way of thinking. So that's partly, I think, an answer to, to, to your excellent uh, otherwise uh, question. Now, I, I would like to, to ask, I mean, we, we as historians tend to think in the long term, but to me, that I grew up in the, I'm a child of the, of the Alayi, of the chains, um, coming from a leftist family for which the populism of Andreas of Andrea was despicable. I mean, we, 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 my father couldn't stand him. And then we, we slightly you know, shifted towards the center because of Semitis. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, could you introduce into your narrative uh, the place of, of, of that aspect of PASOK, of the team around Semitis, the most innovative, reform-minded, perhaps, group in the past 50 years in, in Greek society, and still the, the group uh, the source of most of our most highly valued political personnel. I mean, if one thinks about present day reformers, one would not certainly find them in new democracy, let alone Syriza, but within this 
fragmented, not in Pasok anymore, but in all those people like Yanitsis, uh, Papadopoulos that true, have true, made true, the, the government of Simitis what it is. No, happened. you're very right. Frankly, and to prove that you're very right, I must tell you that I voted for Simitis twice. You were not alone. <laughs> and although I, the words Pasok and Andreas made me shiver, but the man was okay. He was closer to a centrist idea, and by that time Pasok had changed its ways, especially when Simitis came, became prime minister. And you're very right in saying that he did create a generation of technocrats, like Yanitsis, uh, like Harduvelis, yeah. like um, Sturnaras. Most of the people that deal with our economics today, our economic policy or financial or fiscal, are Simitis's people. That's very true. Simitis's failure was he couldn't control his party. Most of his party was corrupt as they get. What Simitis's tactics were is let them steal and leave me do the hard job. And that's what he did. Let them play with stealing whatever they can. Hence the Dukhajopoulos phenomenon, which I'm sure occurred more so during Simitis's time, although I'm probably before as well. But still, I mean, Andreas was, was keeping an eye Ε, να κάνει ένα δωράκι στον εαυτό του, αλλά όχι και τόσο πια. <laughs> Andreas's position. What the thing to say as a prime minister. He's entitled to a little gift to himself, but not so many millions for heaven's sake. This is Andreas talking. Anyway, to go back to the, to the, what you said, um, on the whole, the first term of Simitis was good. The second term, not so good, because his cronies, and even his own people, his own close people, like, uh, what was the name Chukatos. of that? Chukatos. And a couple of others were stealing the public purse blind. Anyway. Yeah, let me, I'd like to, uh, I'm, I'm a first generation Greek, and I happen to be a lawyer as well. <laughs> and, uh, and let me let me give you my take on the Greek situation because uh, I practice international law. And I've had regrettable experiences in dealing with the Greek legal system. I, I think one of the things when you want it, you, I think it's typical of Greeks in Greece to blame somebody else for their problems. So to say that well, you know, it's by lawyers and there's a lot of laws. We have in this country more laws. We make laws every day. But you know what? There's a huge difference. You can't have a country that has no respect and abides with laws. Someone earlier said consequences. In this country, if something goes wrong, you obey the tax authorities or whatever, there is a consequence. Our legal system works. We might not like results, but people respect it. It's efficient. It's not like 15 years that maybe you get a case uh, going on over there. So you can't have a society that is not based on law, that respects law. And because you have to have that to have a viable economic system. There is no really good economic system around that doesn't have a sound legal system. Look at the rest of Europe, look at England, look at the United States. So to me, one of the things that I look at in Greece is that it, it on the outside looks like a capitalist society, but it's not. It's strangled. You can't have private entrepreneurialism. So to me, I look at it as a cultural problem. And the question I have is, how does Greece change? Is this a generational issue? It reminds me of Russia. It's going to take Russia several generations to get out of the mentality. And the other thing that I witnessed over there is when you have a society of young people that grew up in this system and they lived off of their parents, let's face it, that's how a lot of them have. Yeah, they went through the universities. But now, how, how, when is that ever going to change? When is that mentality going to change? The, the one that you say, Cyprus, from the Syriza, reminds me of, of someone that grew up in this society. They have this mentality, so how does Greece get out of this? Well, as you say, it will take a long time. I agree with your point of view. Uh, Greece was always 
uh, under the aegis of the state. Always. All the big public works, everything, the modernization, the practically everything was done by the state. Hence, these great politicians that I mentioned were really doing it with the state. The private sector was never a force in Greek politics as it is here. It was always weak, lymphatic, and under the aegis of the state. Even the private sector, mostly the private sector, let's face it. All the major industries before Greece entered the European Union and had to give them up because there was a big deindustrialization in Greece after Greece entered the European Union because the European Union demanded the rule of the market as opposed to the state. But most of the industries that closed down were there because the state was supporting them with uh, uh, all kinds of props. They were state-supported industries. They were not a real public sector. So then it takes, will take a long, long time to create that kind of mentality. And it's strange because the Greeks, as I said, whenever they go elsewhere, they suddenly, the merchant awakens, the, the entrepreneur awakens, the smart man who can do things. In Greece, you can. The state is there. It's overpowering. It can really uh, make you lose your, your, your zest for something new. So it will take time, certainly. To make a very quick comment, the United States politics is dominated by lawyers. The composition of the House and the Senate is more than 92% lawyers. Ooh. Now, the only people who make change are the chemists. What do you propose? The fact is very real. The land registry. The land registry. The land registry. The Unless a, a country that does not have a clear land registry cannot really uh, sort of enter the next phase of uh, development because it is property that's being used to, to, you know, to get, to use as guarantee to get loans and things. So could that be the reason why Greece hasn't been able to do a land registry since the Ottoman Empire left? That's the sort of, the sort of thing to Oh, the yeah. That's not the reason, it's the outcome. <laughs> it's the consequence of not being, of being a segmented, uh, segmentary society. People don't want a registry because it gives them a chance to trespass on government property or squat on government property. That's how Greek land ownership was made, by squatting on government property. In the Greek War of Independence, when the independence was over, 75% of the land reverted to the state. Turkish lands, everything reverted to the state. The state was the only big owner. There were some landowners in the Peloponnese, but not big, really, if you look at the entire picture. Maybe 10% of the rest. 75% was owned by the state. How did the Greeks acquire property? Did they acquired because the state gave it away? No, Capodistias was ready to do that, but he was killed before he could. Squatting on public land. This is the other championship of the Greeks. One is tax evasion, the other is squatting on public lands, taking them slowly out of the public. And it turns out that instead of the state taking the credit and therefore acquiring credibility, saying, I'm sorry, saying that, ah, you know, the state gave us our land, we're happy, and so forth. They did it themselves. This is the private sector of Greece. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> if I can add to this question, like, you know, when we address the question, why is it that the Greek society remains a fragmentary society as opposed to other European societies that develop at the same time and get rid of some of these elements? I think, don't you think that it's useful also to consider that in, in 
Greek history, let's say in the recent history, there has never been a unifying force that works for other societies, namely uh, a bourgeoisie. A oh, kind of, a I mean, in many ways. There was a bourgeoisie. Well, I. I I Government mean, officials were the Greek right, bourgeoisie. Right, but they are not the real bourgeoisie. Oh, they are, they are, they are. And I'll tell you why. But go ahead. Yeah, no, I was thinking in the sense of what Panagiotis Kondilis wrote. I mean, I, so, no, you don't believe Panagiotis Kondilis? No, no, no. But he talked about no, that. Panagiotis Kondilis resurrected uh, Karl Schmidt, the oh, worst yeah. bastard yeah, in yeah. German history. Yeah, and he, he, he brought him forth, you know who he is. <laughs> He's Hitler's bedfellow. No, Karl no, Schmidt no. is Hitler's bedfellow. And Panagiotis Kondilis, for a very stupid left wing reason, and I'll tell you what that is, yeah. anyone who is against the liberals and against the bourgeoisie, they're great, wonderful man. This guy missed being, passing a, a, a court martial after the war in... Which guy? The German guy? Carl Schmidt. I don't know Schmidt. Well, it's, it's time we learned about this guy. Uh -huh. Well, Carl Schmidt was Hitler's crony. Okay. He was a happened to be an interesting intellectual, but his, his mania was against the liberals. Now, after the war, he re-emerges the son of a bitch as an anti-liberal, and all the lefties embrace Carl Schmidt, including Mr. Stupid Come on. What? Okay, I, I do not know this debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay.